111995 State of Kansas v. Maurice Orlando Stewart. May I please court counsel? Uh, I would request three minutes for a vote, please. Three minutes, Graham. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stewart was convicted of uh, felony murder, aggravated robbery, burglary, and theft. Uh, just for the brief facts, um, Stephen Cook worked for a pipeline company. He traveled around the country uh, working uh, for his job. He was staying at a hotel in Johnson County, and he didn't show up for work. And they went, they found him, and he was uh, uh, dead in his hotel room. I believe at trial it wasn't contested that Mr. Stewart um, caused the injuries which led to his death, and Mr. Stewart claimed that those uh, injuries were made in, in self-defense. And so we raised four issues in the brief. I think I'll just start at the, the front and move back. Uh, the first issue- Before you get started, uh, I don't want to run out of time before we get to something that, uh, that I really need to know, and that's on your uh, uh, issue four, where you're saying the trial judge erred by simply adopting the judgment of the pretrial motion uh, uh, judge's ruling um, and uh, has with regard to blood stain pattern right. uh, evidence. I understand what you're arguing with respect to the trial judge that if we're going to force defendants to object at trial, uh, basically ask for a reconsideration or they waive it, then we should expect the trial judge then to rule on that motion instead of punting. But what difference does that make here? I don't see any argument that you're making that uh, Judge Tatum's pretrial ruling was incorrect. And when I read the trial attorneys, defense attorneys' arguments, they're challenging, want to challenge the foundation, not the fry issue of whether blood pattern examination is a uh, widely accepted procedure, especially in this case where our examiner was certified by an international blood stained examiner organization, it appears that um, Judge Tatum was absolutely right that, that that's not really a new procedure or questionable reliability. And if that's the case, what difference does it make whether Judge Ryan abused his discretion in not re-litigating uh, the motion? That's a long question, but no, you understand no, no, what I, I, I think asking. it's I think it's a, a fair question, and I think uh, I, I think my brief was inadequate. Well, I, I didn't say anything, so it was uh, inadequate on the on the question of, of the the merits of the actual objection, and I I apologize, Ron. I think you may be right um, as far as uh, the because the objection I think at the hearing was also regarding the uh, whether the process used and, and the, the experts, uh, how he Methodologies did it. Methodologies employed right. I, rather than the legit legitimacy of blood uh, stain pattern analysis in general. In fact, uh, defendant hired uh, mm -hmm. his own blood stain pattern expert, correct? That's right, that's right. And the way I read the way I read the defense counsel's argument was uh, at the pretrial motion is uh, I always get these fry hearings for uh, blood splatter uh, experts, which led me to believe she was talking about foundation and challenging the expertise because there's no reason for multiple fry hearings. Right. Sure. Yeah. No. That that's right. And I and I think that was probably um, then addressed. Um, trial. I, I'm not going to withdraw the, the issue, but I, I, I understand your question, and I'm, I don't have a, 
a, a good answer. So foundationally, it was probably addressed in the testimony. Okay, thanks. Uh, on the, the first issue uh, is whether or not there was uh, the judge erred in uh, instructing the juror on how to consider the lessers of first degree murder. Uh, first, uh, before we get into the merits of it, uh, the state raised an, an invited error question, and I have to admit that I'm uh, standing here with my, my hat in my hand on that because at the instructions conference, the judge asked, is this, they were talking about lesser included, so they gave, I think, almost all of, if not all of the lessers, and said, is this the instruction you want as far as the ordering? And defense counsel said, yes. Did, didn't your didn't defense counsel even submit the instruction? The, they did. I, I think the submission of the instructions is less important after grammar or whatever that the, 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 right. the instructions come. Yes, that's yeah, right. Absolutely, it, yes. It came from you and then that's and exactly agreed right. to by you. Okay. That's exactly right. And so, and I, I, I understand that under most circumstances, I would be, would be standing underneath the invited air rock. But I, I, one, I would note that invited air is not a jurisdictional, that this is court could consider issues. And I would ask this court to uh, consider this issue in light of the, the timing of this trial in that the state of lesser included for felony murder was very much in flux. The legislature had uh, said that lessers, there, were, there weren't no lessers for felony murder, and then this court came down with Wells and said that's not retroactive. Uh, and then the legislature came back and said, yes, it is retroactive. And then this uh, case came, uh, this trial happened, and then subsequently in, in Todd, this court said, yes, that's that's correct, and you can do that. And so I think defense counsel was in a new. Uh, we we said it wasn't unconstitutionally ex post facto. Yes, exactly. Yes, that's right. Yes, and the uh, defense counsel was in a difficult position as far as requesting how to deal with the lessers at the time. The the law was that felony murder does have lessers for this crime because it happened prior to the changes. And but yes, regardless. Okay, on the merits. Oh, great. Okay, that's, on that's, this. Jump right there. And, Fantastic. And, uh, uh, the instruction said that you uh, consider first degree premeditated and felony as alternative means mm -hmm. of, of uh, uh, committing first degree. And so it seems to me your argument is since they found felony murder, they must have rejected premeditation, and if they rejected premeditation, then they should have looked at lessers. But they were told, and the law would require them to consider both alternatives before they go to any lessers. That's, that's right. That's right. Um, and so what difference does it make uh, that uh, uh, there could have been lessers uh, on, on premeditation when they don't go there until they get done with first degree, both alternatives. Right. Well, and, and I guess th that's where I draw the line, is that they, they can consider both alternatives, but even if they find guilty of felony murder, if, if they are undecided on premeditated, then they should then move to the lesser included of of why? Because the defendant is entitled when the jury, um, uh, the defendant is entitled for the jury to consider the lesser included if uh, th they don't find on the greater crime. The, the felony already, murder. But they already did because felony no, murder but, and premeditated are the same crime. But but felony murder is not a greater crime of second degree uh, intentional or secondary reckless. It shouldn't act as a stop sign for the lesser Why included tree. Why not? If they're they're convicted of felony, then they're uh, convicted of a alternative means of first degree, then they're uh, convicted of first degree, and you don't go to second degree if you're convicted of first degree. The whole thing is that I understand your frustration because these uh, aren't the same crime, but legally they are. Well, and once you, once you accept the premise that they're both the same first degree crime, even though one has lessers, the other one doesn't, uh, uh, they have different mens rea and all that, but, but we have said, and right now the state of the law is they're the same crime. 
And as long as they're the same crime, if you're convicted of either one, either theory, then you've got a first degree conviction. You don't go to second degree. Well, but I, I would I would say that that is contrary to the legislative legislative intent. Granted, that they said they're all alternative uh, they're alternative means of first degree, and they're both first degree. But they have set up an entirely different system as far as lesser included. They have specifically stated that although they're the same crime. First degree premeditated and felony murder are fundamentally different as it applies to lesser included. They have separated those out. And if the effect of that is that then we now need to consider the lessers, that that's what they've created. See, your argument would, you'd have a really good argument if we had a conviction on a second degree. Uh, because we wouldn't know if that was a lesser of premeditated or a lesser of felony. But once so, they they convict of the first degree, then uh, you have a great academic argument, but a, 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 a practical uh, a bar. I, I, I guess it, it, it just it, it seems to me that uh, on on the, the the narrow issue of lesser included, that the legislature has has cleaved them, has cleaved felony murder from that. I think of it as a tree. It's probably a pole more, but but up and down. And they have cleaved that felony murder away. And so it cannot jump back in. And so you would have to. It's, 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 it's essentially, to me, like they're being charged in the alternative. And, and the pick says when you're charging the alternative, we, you don't stop. You consider all the stuff. That's different than lesser includes. And that's how the legislature has told us to consider these crimes. Like felony murder has been charged in the alternative. It's not because it's the same crime alternative. I understand that. But as far as lesser included, that was their intent. Now, I don't think they intended this, but that, that's, that's neither here nor there. What they have created a separate scheme for lesser included, for premeditated, and none for felony murder. And so felony murder, I don't think, can jump in and stop it, uh, uh, stop that consideration of that line. Uh, I would submit the other issues over there. Oh, yeah. Do you want to talk about invited error on your force argument too? Oh yeah, yeah. Now I, I guess I do not have my hat in my hand on that because I think there are there are two. Um, the, there was a packet of instructions given, and uh, nothing was said about this degree of force on that. And I'm asking that the particular instruction be given, and it was not included in the packet of that. And so the jury was instructed. Subsequently, the jury sends out a question. And says, "What about the force on? What kind of force is used for the wall?" And the uh, defense counsel says, "Well, we just need to refer back to that." So, if I was making an argument that that was the wrong answer, then yes, I would have an invited error problem because that's what they said to do. But I don't think that what I'm complaining about is the initial packet was given to the jury. That's the, the complaint, and we did not invite the judge to fail to give the instruction in the initial packet. The it, better course at that time to say to, to raise it subsequently during deliberations. But the if on the issue of the initial submitting the packet, we did not ask the judge, uh, we did not invite the judge not to give the instruction in the in the packet. I don't think subsequent ratification of that um, creates invited air. I mean, obviously, clearly erroneous, but it's not invited air. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Counsel. May it please the Court. State appears by Stephen Obermeyer. Uh, I'll address the uh, three issues in the same order and rest on the brief on the other issues. Uh, issue four, uh, we're four days into jury trial and the defendant wants to renew the Fry hearing for the evidence. Uh, Judge Ryan denies that and, and says something like, at this point, which to me means that if there's some lack of foundation or issue, the defendant can object that there's a lack of foundation and raise it that way. But you shouldn't have uh, 12 jurors and however many alternates cooling their heels. Well, we're going to reconsider a uh, uh, motion uh, but he for a fry waived, hearing. You, if he had, you would have said he waived, waived that issue. Yeah, no, cause if he objected at, at, to the testimony of the witness, I, I think that would be 
preserved. Uh, I don't think you have to re request a motion for that. And and it should have been done at the pretrial. Well, even if it had been done at the pretrial hearing. Well, you say in your brief you talk about. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Obermeyer, we're, we're, uh, you and I are celebrating over 15 years of, of uh, arguing back and forth, and so uh, uh, I couldn't let your last day go without uh, 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 continuing that, that, that process. Okay. Um, you, you talk about ordinarily an issue that's been determined uh, 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 isn't reheard, and that this deters a party from raising issues with the trial judge that had already been argued before a different judge, but this court requires that to be done, or we accept your argument that they waived by not making that argument and asking for that determination to be done again at trial. Um, and so I, I'm, I, I'm a little unclear about why we're, we're saying that this is an inefficiency in the court proceeding when we insist on it to preserve the uh, to preserve the issue well, you follow I, what I'm saying I, I think and I guess I would liken it to we, we don't ask the judge to rehear motions to suppress uh, four days into trial we object contemporaneously well, yeah we do if they don't if they don't object and, and get a new ruling and the court, we say that the reason is that the new evidence that may have come in may pre present some different light, and so we require a new ruling from the from the court. Uh, I agree that there has to be a contemporaneous objection. Yeah. And the argument here is that the judge abused his discretion by not independently considering that objection or that issue and simply deferring to Judge Tatum's ruling. And, and I think the, the out on that is when the judge said, I'll overrule that at this point, I'll go with what Judge Tatum says. And that, so that way, if there is a lack of uh, foundation, uh, which I perceive this as, because the, the reason for the motion two years earlier was because defense counsel had never not done one. Uh, and and you know blood spatter testimony is pretty pretty common and it's not the stuff of which fry hearings and now Daubert hearings um, are are made uh, as to issue and, and you do make that argument that now we're not even dealing with fry so if it was remanded for a fry hearing um, it would be contrary to what our statutory law is that's correct. Yeah. Um, as to uh, issue one, I, I think I just have a, a disagreement as to if the jury finds the defendant guilty of first-degree murder under either theory, whether they have to consider lessers. And I would direct the court to uh, the jury instructions uh, at pages uh, 334, volume 1, 334, which tells the jury uh, if you do not agree the defendant is guilty of murder in the first degree, you should then consider the lesser included offense of intentional murder in the second degree. In volume one, page 348, which tells the jury at the end that, that you shall con first you shall consider whether the defendant is guilty of murder in the first degree. If you find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree, the presiding juror shall sign the applicable verdict form and determine under which theory. It, it does not require the jury to consider uh, lessers. Uh, so even if we get to the get past the invited error, uh, it's it's not clearly erroneous uh, in that how, situation. How can we have invited error if there is no error? Are well, you the, saying that the instructions were not erroneous? That that is the way to do it? That you look at it and if they uh, find guilty on either theory of first degree, they don't go to the to the lessers anyway? That, that's, that's correct. So, right, it, it would not even be erroneous. Um, that, that's correct, sure. Um, as to issue number two, um, the, okay, uh, the jury's deliberating and has a question, uh, what's the definition of the use of force in taking the wallet? Uh, and that's, this is the, the basis for, for issue number two. And there's a discussion between the trial judge and the uh, attorneys on what we, what we should do. 
And uh, defense counsel, or the court says, I think we should refer them to instructions 24 20, and 25, which is uh, aggravated robbery elements instruction. Uh, defense counsel says, our request would be to just give them the generic, we must refer you back to the instructions. My experience has been that typically it's the instruction as a whole and leave it at that rather than a specific instruction. And that's at volume 16, page 224. So that's the basis for any uh, invited error argument. Uh, but but it, it, again, it's not erroneous to refer the jury back to the elements of the aggravated uh, robbery. Well, the, the jury instructions are accurate. Um, yeah. and, and, the, and the defendant was instructed that self-defense is a defense and and uh, if you find he used uh, self-defense, then the defendant's not guilty. So. And they rejected that. And the jury re rejected that. So whether they were instruct, uh, not instructed to ignore self-defense is sort of uh, irrelevant here because we know they didn't use that force because they rejected self-defense. I, th I think that's the case. But my more fundamental question is, why isn't self-defense force still force for the robbery statute? Um, I if think you, if the robbery statute says you can't take property from another by force, and whether you call that self-defense force or whatever, uh, if you're taking the property knowingly taking the property by force, wh why do we need to differentiate the, whether it was initially for self-defense or not? Well, I, I think the jury, if the jury believed that he acted in self-defense, which was their argument throughout, then... But they, he but still they, wouldn't have a right to take his wallet. That's what you're getting at. Yeah. And once you decide to steal, you're out of luck. That's his point. And, and I think there is a case, uh, uh, I cited a case on, um, like in 4K not second, on the use of force would be... Uh, we have a case that says they don't have to be concurrent, that you can use force and then subsequently when you uh, uh, disable them you can, and, and steal, then that's taking by force. Uh, uh, but, but you can't... You can't have self-defense for an ag robbery because uh, you can't commit a, a forcible crime uh, uh, as an aggressor. You can't have self-defense. That's yes. Yeah, and so once they find that he took the property, then self-defense is out of the calculus, isn't it? I I think it is, and, and the facts support that in that you have a. Uh, 57 year old man who's in the bathroom with with bleeding out in there basically uh, and he was on the floor uh, th that's not a self-defense situation against well, the 20 but, but we're not faced with us making the factual determination we're that's we're, true we're faced with what whether it was legally required to tell the jury what what we were legally required to tell the jury they needed to decide right and, and and where we need to get to is that uh, they did not need to be told that the force uh, used to take the property could not be self-defense force, or we needed to tell them it, it, it was, they had to distinguish. I, I, I don't think they needed to be told that that force uh, would uh, qualify for the aggravated robbery. And, and, and the, the, the parties argued, I mean, the defendant argued self-defense um, and the state argued that under the facts that wasn't a self-defense issue, uh, so self-defense wouldn't even apply. But, and that's why uh, I think there's not error at all uh, in referring the jury back to the jury instructions um, and that it did not make a difference in, in the uh, trial that Mr. Stewart received a, a fair trial. Uh, unless the court has any other questions. <laughs> Just, yeah, sorry, I can't, can't let you go. <laughs> um, under these facts, we have 
it, we have the uh, the murder charges, and I don't know was there ag battery or whether I don't know. We have the those those type of charges, and mm -hmm. then we have the the taking the property, the uh, ag robbery. Could self defense have been uh, applicable to those? Uh, person crimes, but inapplicable to the uh, ag robbery? Um, Do you follow what I'm saying? I, if, I'm, if, if, if the jury had found, okay, there was self-defense involved in uh, uh, what he did to uh, Mr. Cook, mm -hmm. uh, but there wasn't self-defense involved in taking his wallet. I mean, is it an all or nothing thing when you have different charges? Well, the, the uh, right, the murder and the, and the ag robbery were at the same time, so, and and uh, the defendant took the wallet and the bottle, well, two bottles of tequila. Let me, let me ask, ask you a different way. Okay. Could he have been not guilty of the murder because of self-defense, but nevertheless been guilty of ag robbery for having taken the wallet after he defended himself and disabled Mr. Cook. I think under the felony murder theory, which is during the course of the, uh, in killing during the course of the aggravated robbery, that, uh, you couldn't just you could not justify it that way. I mean, maybe if you had a, it could be maybe an inconsistent verdict, but I, I don't think uh, an acquittal of the murder, which includes the robbery, uh, would uh, that self defense could apply to one well, under the under the felony murder? Yeah, you would have because you wouldn't have the the element of bank robbery. Right. But but they the self defense doesn't come into play with felony murder at all anyway um, well if, if they found self-defense as to the ag robbery then it would not have been a murder during the commission of a felony I think I think he was asking about the reverse hypothetical okay mm -hmm. if he if he could if we would have some sort of problem or legal issue if he was acquitted of the murder and convicted of the ag robbery for having taken the wallet after the victim was disabled by the self-defense violence or force. Um, yeah, maybe. Uh, uh, I just see them as one in the in the same. I think. But, but the problem is, you can't have self-defense on ag robbery. You can't right. commit a, a ag robbery and and have a finding of self-defense because you can't be an aggressor for that kind of a crime. Right. And and claim self-defense. Right. The, the uh, uh, victim was still alive when the defendant left the, the uh, hotel room with that, so I, I think it would still be both the uh, ag robbery and uh, during the course of the felony murder, so I, I think it would be both on that. Further questions? I, I would just ask that you affirm his convictions. Thank you. First of all, I would uh, take issue with the idea that the jury rejected his claims of self-defense. If you read the, especially the prosecutor's closing argument, they're talking about why self-defense doesn't apply. It's all couched in terms of this was a premeditated murder. You look at the injuries, look at how much it was, this couldn't have been self-defense, therefore it was premeditated. And the jury rejected the premeditated claim. And so I think it's sort of up in the air then as far as whether or not they accepted his self-defense or whether they, they did not accept his self-defense. Um, and as to whether or not the, the statute says force, and admittedly I am asking you to read in to that unlawful, the term unlawful force. But it seems to me that the gist of a robbery is why a robbery is so much more severe and punished more harshly than theft is because of the force and the fear and the terror that that 
and he hunts. If the force used is legal, if that is permissible, if that is something that we as society say, yes, you may take this force, so he's acting in self-defense, then it seems counterintuitive to then use that permissible force to enhance what is in essence a theft. He committed a legal act, which is a, a, a force, and then separately, he committed a, a, a different act. But he didn't commit a legal act with respect to ag robbery because you could not have self-defense if you're the aggressor in a crime like that. We have case law that says self-defense does not apply. And we also have case law that says if you disable someone and, and then take their property, that the force doesn't have to coincide with the taking. And so with those two precedents, how do you get to your theory that you could, that you could rob someone with self-defense? Because, um, one, I would say it's not, you're not robbing them with self-defense. It's not self-defense. And the, as far as the initial aggressor goes, that in, like in this case, Mr. Stewart said he was not the initial aggressor. Mr. Cook was the initial aggressor. And so, and he defended himself. That was the force he was using. He was not the initial aggressor. He defended himself, disabled him, and then saw a wallet, found an opportunity, took it. So he wasn't the initial, he wasn't the initial aggressor. He was, he was responding to Mr. Cook's aggression. And I, I don't take any issue with the, uh, the fact that the wallet, uh, that because it happened after he was disabled, that somehow that, that, that means it's not a rob robbery. That's not my point. My point is that the, the force was legal. Go ahead. I thought you argued that the only thing he could be guilty of was theft. That is what I argued, yes. Because the force was legal. Now, sir, he, he, he took the wallet. That was a crime. He took the wallet. The question is, is there force which elevates theft to a robbery? And the force here, uh, in, in theory, was legal force. He, he, he was permitted to do that. And you concede, though, you concede, though, that the definition of robbery does not uh, differentiate between what kind of force. It, it, it does not say unlawful force. That's correct. Oh, that's the end of my presentation. Um, and we just let's clear anything else. I, I would like to address the court outside the four corners of my criminal case and note that this is Mr. Obermeyer's last argument. And I would like to uh, note that he presents his cases with uh, professional advocacy and intelligent representation. And on behalf of myself, the Appellate Defender Office, and both the Appellate Bar, thank you for your service. Thank you. The court will take that case under advisement.